father was born in Chinatown, just down there. Oh, wow. In the Flatiron Building. So you you can still see that building, right? It's like a triangle in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. He was born right there, 1912. Mm -hmm. And um, don't know a lot about my father. I knew he was a bit of a, maybe a bit of a gangster. He actually rode the rails oh, with wow. his friends. They, I think that's maybe what happened to him, why his, his lungs bothered him all his life. Because when you ride the trains through the mountains, apparently the dust gets shaken down and it'll kill you if you're not uh, prepared for that. So uh, they would ride the train to Vancouver, him and his buddies here. I met some of them when they were older and they sounded like they were just hoodlums, really. Um, <laughs> my father went to BC to become a fisherman. That's how he met my mother who worked in the canning factory. And uh, I guess the war in a way did us a favor, right? Moved us oh, back to back to, to Alberta. Alberta. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they were good fishermen either. <laughs> that, that's what I saw. <laughs> but he was a damn good farmer, right? He's an amazing farmer. Yeah, I mean, he went up to how many acres did he did he farm at the end there? Yeah, two thousand of potatoes. Which yeah, is like which, which is insane. That's I mean, three that's square miles. It's <sighs> a lot of potatoes. Yeah, I mean, and I guess he he had deals going on with Safeway in the U.S. and they couldn't supply enough, and oh, I mean that's all just all great. But he passed away in in two thousand three, and and uh, yeah. but I mean, your memories of your father are, are, are essentially good, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That, now, with the with the film that your cousin did, because it has to do with the farmer and the farming, and yeah, you know, talk is is that at that time that that film was being done, Clint Eastwood was was also shooting Unforgiven, and they sent a couple people or whatever out to help. That is true. Well, that's great. And my dad, okay, my dad was potato king of the world. Yeah, that was his title. So he had trophies massive awards and one of the things he would do is he liked to grow corn and go out with a pickup truck and just sell it on the street so people just thought oh he's the guy who sells corn because he hated Tabor corn sorry Tabor he just <laughs> hated it he thought our corn was better we were from Rainier so he would go sell our corn and one of the things he did was he took bags of corn to Clint Eastwood Oh, wow. where they were shooting the film and said, you know, try our corn. So Clint loved the corn and he signed a photo to my dad. And, um, and through that he possibly found out about the film and, yeah. and then they helped. It all connected. Oh, that's great. So that is true. All of that's true. Now, when you, you recently did the installation mm -hmm. in Arts Commons, where it was a 12.3 uh, surround sound situation. So what, what made you do something like that? I've been creating this ambient music in my own house, yeah. just to help me slow down time and mm -hmm. relax. That's what started it. And uh, I guess the initial experiments where uh, I would be playing different pieces of ambient music on multiple speakers in my place and just seeing how they mix together. That's how it started. And then I started writing my own. And, um, well, that's really the only answer I got, Mike. You, you were telling people that you're in the process of slowing down time. Mm -hmm. And prior to them going in to see and listen to the installation, you told them to listen closely to the bass yeah because that focus would allow you to slow down time yeah explain that uh, it's it's the same as focusing on your breathing when you meditate so that repetitive bass note uh, puts you in the now and time will slow down it's not going to speed by and you don't have to go along with it and speed up go along with the, the speeding up of time even though you have a huge history, you can focus on the now. And you can make the summer last long. You can make Christmas feel like it's ages away. You can still do that. 
I don't like time zipping by really fast. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on and you're 60 now, and yeah. just about. So just about. So I understand, you know, how time, you know, how Christmas comes and then the next Christmas seems to come very quickly. And yeah. Yeah, that, I understand it, but if you consciously change your mind, you can slow it down. You, you love certain parts of technology and yet you hate other parts of technology. Mm -hmm. I, what do you love about technology? Freedom. Um, I love computers and software. I yeah. love the internet. I also hate computers and software. Hate the internet. Right. It's um, it's not that simple. The whole thing. I like the fact that you can stay in touch with people. Right. But I don't like staying in touch with people. My wife and I do this thing where we don't text, we don't Skype. Wow. We, we never do that. What we did when, uh, years ago, and when I say years ago, I mean like six years ago, we wrote paper letters with an envelope and a stamp. And that's wow. how we communicate. And that way you can slow down the passage of time. You're not responding to your emails like every minute or your text messages. And, uh, so that's like the old way of communicating. We like the old way, yeah. Yeah. So recently I quit Facebook, I say within the last couple of years. The whole idea of this technology tracking every single movement we do right. bothers me. Uh, uh, the plus side is, let's, if we go back to the music, mm -hmm. you can, I can sell music anywhere. And that's amazing. Yeah. Right? So the, the international universal uh, record store. Yeah, I don't need a record label. For what? That's right. What would I need it for? Anyone can get my music off iTunes. Um, I guess one of the problems for a lot of artists is they feel there's so much competition you can't be found. But right. I'm not concerned about that. If you want to find me, just put my name in there, you'll find me. That's amazing. So that part I like that I can uh, sell music anywhere in the world. And I like that they collect the money, they pay it, pay it to me. Right. You're not chasing a record company down. I, I've had, um, had a label in Europe that never paid me anything. And if I wanted to pursue them, I had to go to France to do it. Oh, wow. Right, so I wasn't gonna do that. And they sent me all the contracts in French. So I just thought, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm not gonna bother. Yeah. But now, all those problems are gone, so yeah, I can't because complain. Of the, because of the internet. But, but there too, you, you make uh, a great deal more off selling a hard copy record or a CD than you do off any kind of a download. Mm, I'm gonna say no. Really? Yeah, really. Yeah, I just thought, you know, you're making your own records, you're, 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 you're distributing them. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say streaming doesn't pay well. Right. Okay, but iTunes, I get about 65 cents out of every song. That's pretty good. That's darn good. Uh, the overhead for that is what? Zero. Yeah, so how can that, how can a record compete, compete with that? iTunes changed the game. Exactly. Right. Exactly. The whole idea of selling a song for 99 cents, that's, that's kind of been saved. That's what saved me, really. You know, we've ha we had vinyl, we had uh, the whole internet thing come up. What do you think is going to be the future of music? I have no idea. You're asking the wrong person. Yeah. You really are. I am so old school, I just, I'm the wrong person to ask. Right. Everything I do is, is not what people, other people are doing. It just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. You understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, I totally understand. So that. I'm still making records. I'm still making, like the, the interview I did with David Beach. It we, was great. We printed that on paper. Okay. It's a paper interview. Which is... Uh, Nobody does that. It's a great way to read something. It's a great way to get an insight into what someone's like. Yeah, I like it. But uh, I don't... I'm the, I'm the wrong person to, to ask. Mm -hmm. For example, my studio is um, it's made up of computers that are really old right. when I say that over 10 years and I will never upgrade them what I did 
was I bought copies of the same computers. And they're loaded with the same software, so when this one dies, I have another one. I'm not right. going to upgrade my software, I'm not going to upgrade my system. That's my studio, that's my instrument. That's great. So that, to me, the future is to stick with what what works. What works, yeah. yeah. I guess there's nothing wrong with familiarity. No. It's beautiful. This is the whole <coughs> problem with electronic music. Is people get some software, and they get a bunch of sounds, and they put together some music, and then the new software comes out and they go, wow, I want that, because it's gonna have new sounds. And then they get all new ideas. It's like getting handed a new instrument every year. Right, you gotta learn your instrument. So treat your computer like it's a violin, mm -hmm. learn that instrument, and then you're not, uh, then you become good at something. I guess that's what I, I would say would be good advice for electronic people. You know, I think I think we we share the same the same the same outlook. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, I'm all for change mm -hmm. as long as change makes sense. Okay. As long as the the, the change that's going on is is a, is a is a plus. You know what an SACD is? Ah, uh, kind of. Kinda. You know yeah. who invented that? Who? I think Ed Meitner, who's from Calgary. SACDs are no longer supported format vastly superior but never took off right. so um, it's not what's best it's what's most popular and everything I do has nothing to do with what's popular I personally find albums to be very important that's right. that's the art form is the album and if there's an infinite number of them, they have no value. So I always limit it. To me, they're more valuable that way. Am I reaching the maximum audience? No, not really. But would my audience be that much bigger if I didn't limit it? Not really. Right. Right. Uh, I still, even in the last month, I still get requests for box sets. And I just tell them they're sold out because they are. They're but aren't you holding back a certain amount of them to? Well, it depends on what you think. There were a hundred that were not released, mm -hmm. but they may be destroyed. <laughs> because you know what? You, what? Know what? You, you, you know, you're a bit of an enigma. Okay. It's, it's, you know, I've known you all these years and yet I don't know you. That's true, you don't know me. You know, I mean, uh, uh, and I don't know you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So I guess I guess it's better to say that I've known of you. You know the article that Dave Veach did? That's great. That explains a lot of things. I loved that article. I think it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I, I really appreciated what he did. Oh yeah, he's a great writer. There was a lot. Uh, I revealed a lot to him yeah. that nobody else had ever heard. Mm -hmm. And he put it into a readable form. And, um, I was uncomfortable with it at first. Right. I would say that. That's the first time I let a picture of myself be shown. Just me. And this is the first time I'm letting that happen on video. This. And the Arts Commons video. So when right. you think about it, this is the first year in 35 years that I really let that happen. Do you have any kind of an idea as to what you're going to do oh, yeah. for the next project? Absolutely. Can you tell us? No, I can't. But I've been, <laughs> I have it. I've been thinking about this project for five years. Okay. And I started work on it five years ago. Every time I make an album, I try to uh, start the next album before it comes out. Ooh. I've done that every time. So when Thick as a Brick came out, I was already working on the next project mm -hmm. by the release date. And that way I know I'm on a path and I'm not going to be swayed whether that album fails or succeeds. What's your definition of failure or success? Uh, my definition of success is that people find the album and then they listen to it and then they write to me. And they tell me what they think or if they like it. Mm -hmm. So if I can connect to enough people, that's a success. And to me, enough people's not millions. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, a small number of people, but it's enough. Once, you know, it's a numbers thing, it, 
if what's the most successful album of all time maybe thriller uh it's thriller rumors uh there's Rumor. uh, sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club yeah. band so pick I mean, one, right yeah so what kind of numbers did thriller do uh hundreds uh, millions millions and millions millions and millions let's say 50 million that means like about yeah. seven billion people didn't buy that album. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a really good way of looking at it. Right? Right. A lot of people didn't. So what's the difference for me if I sell 10 or 1,000 copies or a million? There's no difference. Have you noticed how much exaggeration there is in this world? <laughs> well, about well I, think you could, I think you could change the exaggeration to bullshit. Okay. <laughs> Just... The number of units people sell, the number of streams they get, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. It, it, it is ridiculous. I mean, I will tell you, and this is a fact, I did get three million streams. I have the documentation and the payments from CD Baby to prove it. Wow. And it means nothing. Yeah. I can't even find where, these, where the music's, music's being used, but I've been paid for it. Right. And so three million is a lot for an indie, but it's nothing in this world. Somebody can sell a million records, and then their next record sells half a million, and it's considered a failure. Yeah, we saw that with, like, Tusk. It sold next to nothing. It was a, it was a, a stiff. Next to nothing was, like, what, 300,000 copies? Oh, it, a lot. It still, it still <laughs> did close to half a million copies. Yeah, I, I will never sell that many in my life. Yeah. So it's all perspective. You're, you're a lot more famous. You're a lot well, better <laughs> known everywhere else in the world than you are here. No, I don't want to be famous. I don't like having to think about it being no recognized in a restaurant or something. Yeah. I just want total freedom. Yeah. So it's perfect to be famous in, say, Germany or somewhere, but not here. Do you know what my spirit animal is? No. What is it? It's a gopher. Now, when people do their quest and they be, you know, most people, it's, it's an eagle or something. Mine's a gopher. Right. And it's perfect because a gopher is very... Uh, you don't really notice them, but all their works are underground, sort of secret, they're big on family, but they don't brag about it. Uh, my first memory is on the potato farm, on a swing in the summertime singing She Loves You by the Beatles. <laughs> oh, that's great. I was probably four years old, something like that. Right. That's a clear memory. I've never forgotten that. Yeah. <laughs> What's your greatest fear? This is going to sound kind of funny, but I don't really have a fear. Nothing. I can't think of anything. What would have been your biggest mistake in your Jeez, life? Jeez, Mike. This is... <laughs> <laughs> I should have given you these beforehand. So you should you have because think about it. I can't think of a single mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you I never thought. You never thought. Oh, I did such and such. Oh my goodness, that's such a huge mistake. I should never have done that. No. Good for you. I've done a lot of things that were wrong, and people, th other people have said that's a mistake. But myself, I've never really felt that, felt that way. And I'm not. I'm not lying to you. I. I I just, I've always thought life is like, you go along mm -hmm. and you do the best you can. You try not to hurt people. Right. Sometimes things go wrong and that's part of life. Your greatest personal achievement. I'm gonna stop, no. Okay. Try again. Your hope for the future. <laughs> What's your hope for the future? My hope for the future is that people will try and be more tolerant. Right. On a small scale. Um, I see it all the time, people who don't get along. If we can't get along on the street here with just two people, how can countries get along? Mm -hmm. So I just hope people will learn to be more tolerant and accepting, and I'm hoping that happens. Great albums. So this list, I went through this a lot. And the five albums I'm gonna give you right now were not the five albums I had yesterday. 
and they're not the five albums. Actually, I'm going to change the list right now. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> because this is an impossible task. That's, that's not very many albums. Uh, first on my list is Kate Bush, The Dreaming. Oh. That album uh, is an amazing album from start to finish. She's doing stuff that no one else did or has done. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, the next one is Queen, A Night at the Opera. When you revisit this album, I, I heard it when I was young, when it came out and it was new, but every time I go back to it, I'm amazed at how that album flows and how much ground it covers. It's a really, really interesting album. Next one. Uh, Super Tramp, Crime of the Century. Mm -hmm. That album is still very listenable from start to finish, and I think it's their best album. It's, uh, it's almost a prog rock album, I think. But the reason I like it is because of the use of keyboards. <clears throat> Number four, Japan Tindrum. Oh, yeah. That's that their one. greatest album. It still stands up. If you haven't heard Tindrum, I recommend you listen to that album. That was the band's last album. So they broke up at their peak, I think. Well, it's their last studio album. But nobody seems to have taken that and continued on in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it sort of stands alone. The last album, no, I'm not doing that one. The fifth album, fifth greatest album of all time would be Yes, Close to the Edge. It's a perfect album from start to finish and as a complete package, I think it's one of the greats. Yeah. yeah. Well, Walt, I love your music. I love you. Thank you. God bless. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs>